rather rare uh, find for Gold Beach. She was appointed by President Obama to the National Science Foundation. It's probably the most influential group of people we have in this country in terms of the advancement of science and funding programs that would not get any other funding. Um, I know when I was a young man and just getting out of school and doing graduate work, uh, the uh, professors that I worked with lived in fear of what was going to happen with their funding. I mean, the experiments we, I was working on were multi-million dollar experiments, and without the NSF, they would never have occurred. Um, but uh, it was kind of black magic. Uh, there was a highly political environment I was in, and I always thought the NSF was this godlike organization. So uh, we're going to have an explanation today that will probably dispel my, uh, my visions of what there was in, in Washington. So uh, without further ado. was delighted to get this invitation, even though I was reminded yet once again why I never was a professor, because, you know, for a half hour talk, it was like three days to pull this together, even though I kind of know what, um, you know, know the, don't know the material, it was a matter of trying to get the story together right. So, um, is it, you know, that's, that, um, that's what Beginning professors find too. It takes them easily three to ten times as long to prepare a class as it does to actually give it. So anyway, um, this is not part of the talk, but I had it up there just as eye candy. Uh, this is an array of millimeter wave telescopes. So you probably have heard of radio telescopes. Um, these are ones that look out into the heavens and detect radiation coming in from all over the universe at a particular wavelength. These are looking at the wavelength that's oh, sort of like this, this big. And they are looking for planets that are orbiting um, stars in other stars in this galaxy as well as stars in other galaxies. This particular array of telescopes is in the Andes um, mountains in Chile. There we go. Um, at uh, an elevation of 17,000 feet. So very rarefied. <laughs> it's a very rarefied um, environment. And in fact, when you go there, they give you supplemental oxygen just as a matter of course. So that, um, and, and we were able to walk around. First, they have to check and make sure your blood pressure and all that kind of thing is, is within normal limits. Um, but it is just phenomenal um, to, to, um, to see something like that. And the images that come from this um, are also unbelievable. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that. Just that was just to kind of keep the um, put something for the background. Now, what I am going to talk about is about the National Science Foundation and its impact on our lives. And in one way or another, it actually does impact the lives of all of us. Um, and I will I will start big. I'll get down to a few examples here actually in Oregon, and um, one of them uh, just up the coast in Charleston. Um, the National Science Foundation um, owes its beginning to, well, it was begun in 1950. It actually came out uh, in the aftermath of World War II. Before World War II, science in this country was basically funded by philanthropists and industry. And um, it was sort of an ad hoc kind of thing. World War II, which was viewed as, I think rightly, as an existential crisis for this country and for life as we know it, really changed that. And of course, the research at that point was very much directed towards winning the war. And so there were government efforts um, that focused the work of many people in universities, in industry, basically whoever could contribute to the war effort was brought in. Uh, that gave rise to the radar effort, um, the Manhattan Project, which also started in, um, in this Office of Science, um, Science Research for Defense, I think, OSRD. Um, and um, that was kind of the beginning of big science in this country and arguably had a lot to do with our prevailing in World War II. Um, after the war, 
there was then thought about what should come next. The value of this large science and a more organized investment in science was recognized. And Van Ever Bush, the man uh, pictured in this, uh, in, in this slide, um, who had directed the, the research effort in World War II from Washington, not the Manhattan Project, but the radar and, and all of that other stuff, was, um, came up with this concept that he, record, he wrote in a rather short monograph called Science, the Endless Frontier. And that uh, report basically um, proposed forming a, um, an, a, a federal entity, which became the National Science Foundation. Um, there was a lot of back and forth about whether you invest in existing centers of excellence or you, you know, do a chicken in every pot kind of thing and spread it fairly evenly across the country. At that time, the prevailing, the view that ended up prevailing was investing in centers of excellence. I must say that is being revisited to a certain extent now, but um, that is was the um, what was the, the vision at the time. The mission of the National Science Foundation was and continues to be to promote the progress of science, to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare and to secure the national defense. In other words, for the greater national good. And I'll give you a few examples of contributions that NSF has made, particularly towards economic competitiveness, which is, of course, something that we're all very concerned about now. NSF is the only agency in the federal government that has a mandate to support all non-medical fields of research. There are lots of other federal entities that support different things. NASA supports space research. Um, NSF supports ground-based universe, you know, kind of uh, astronomical and, astro uh, and astrophysical research. Um, there are the National Institutes of Health, of course, supports medical research. Um, the military supports various research that is very directly related to national defense, um, agriculture, so forth. So there are other agencies that do support science, but NSF is the only one that covers everything to one degree or another. By the numbers, NSF has what certainly looks to any, I think, um, normal human being has a very large number, $8.3 billion. That was in 2020. To put it in perspective, however, the budget of the National Institutes of Health is $34 billion. So this is one-fifth of the size of the National Institutes of Health to cover all of science that isn't medicine. So, you know, if you take that comparison, I would argue that that is a pretty reasonable rate of investment. It supports about a quarter of the basic research performed by colleges and universities. Almost all of NSF's funding goes to colleges and universities in one form or another. It supports a lots of different kinds of things. It supports individual scientists who are in their labs running their research groups and performing research by themselves with presumably a few collaborators in their lab. It supports groups and centers. These may be groups of researchers in a particular university. They may be rather large centers that span a number of different institutions. Major facilities, those telescopes I showed you earlier, major facility. There are lots of different kinds of those. They run the uh, US presence in Antarctica ever since the late 50s when Antarctica was declared non-military and for science and for the benefit of all. The National Science Foundation is the responsible entity in the United States for that. And the U.S. is the major presence, although there are many other presences in Antarctica. NSF supports lots and lots of students, all the way from um, the, mostly, mostly at the university and um, graduate level. They support many graduate students. They provide research experiences for undergraduates, um, which helps bring students in and get them interested in potentially pursuing a career in science. And they also support many science education programs at lower levels. And they do, and they do a lot of research on, on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education in the K through 12. Impact. Well, one impact 
is that there are 253 individuals who have won Nobel Prizes who can trace at least part of their success to the National Science Foundation. I picked just four here. The one in the upper left hand corner actually has a tiny connection to Gold Beach and that is the discovery of gravitational waves because Kip Thorne was one of the um, individuals who won the Nobel Prize and he at least has had a place here in Gold Beach in the past. Um, the other thing that is very cool about the discovery of gravitational waves is that the facilities, LIGO, look, long interferometric gravitational observatory. Um, there are two of them. One of them is in Hanford, Washington. The other is in Louisiana. These were initially constructed back in the 90s. They knew in the 90s, they did not have the technology to detect gravitational waves at that time. But they had to start the research so that they could develop the technology so they could detect the gravitational waves. And it took them until 2016 or thereabouts to actually um, get the technology good enough to be able to discover it, discover the gravitational waves. Since then, they have observed black holes and lots of other cool things. So that's one Nobel Prize. Moving down, this year's Nobel Prize in Medicine went to two individuals. One of them, David Julius, was responsible for uh, determining structure and function of proteins that are key to heat and pain perception, something that touches all of us. What's really cool about his NSF award was it was an early career award. The National Science Foundation was one of, was was the entity that actually gave him his start in research. They were willing to invest in him and take a chance. So both of these give an example, give examples of how um, National Science Foundation is willing to take bets, which many times pay off hugely in terms of our knowledge and, and advances. And this lower one um, clearly has uh, the potential for major impact on our lives. Um, upper right hand corner, the 2018 prize in medicine went to Frances Arnold. Uh, she is at Caltech and using directed evolution to engineer enzymes, which gives you the potential of engineering um, various materials, various biological species, so forth. It's given rise to several companies that have started up. NSF gave her her first grant. And finally, the last one is the this year's prize in economics, which I can't pretend to under, understand or be able to explain real well, but basically uh, what these guys did was that they understood they explored how you could take these very large data sets and from those very large sets of data understand the impact of one thing on another. So for example, the impact of income on health or how wages affect unemployment, that sort of thing. So that is getting into data science, which is a relatively new area of science, um, and um, they clearly had an economic twist to what they were looking at. Okay. The image here is a mural at the National Science Foundation's headquarters in Alexandria. It's really, it's very impressive. It's about 30 feet long. And um, there is a website that, uh, from which I got this image um, that I encourage you, if you just Google NSF mural, you can find it. And it has a, um, a glossary, so you can look up all these different things because every one of these connects to something that NSF has done or does do. Um, I've now started on the left third of that, just picking out a few. So, working my way around from the left, you know, you know how geckos crawl up walls? Well, studying what it is about the, their, um, their feet that enables them to stick and unstick um, so that they can climb the walls gives rise to new classes of adhesives. Um, next one, number six, retinal prostheses, giving um, blind people um, with certain conditions the opportunity to actually see at some level. Um, that work came out of, was funded by NSF. Lower left, extremely current, um, PCR, polymerase, polymerase chain reaction. Um, this was developed um, from microbes at Yellowstone National Park using National Science Foundation funding. You have probably heard PCR recently because that is the gold standard test for COVID-19. So something we might care about a little bit. 
Um, number 10 is telescopes. Uh, I showed you the radio telescopes in Chile. There are various telescopes looking in the visible, in the infrared, in the ultraviolet, various, various uh, wavelength ranges. And these have gotten to be such expensive pieces of equipment that no one agency, no one entity, no one country even in many cases can fund them anymore. But NSF is the major funder on many of those in Hawaii, in Chile, in Arizona, various places around the world. And they are open to users from around the world. NSF has funded startups like Google, which might or might not be a good thing right now, but um, you know, clearly there has been economic impact and there has been, um, and it has changed the way we do a lot of things. The structure of the HIV virus um, was determined using NSF funding. Okay, now I've moved to the middle of, the, of that slide, of, of that mural, and uh, number 29 there, RFID scanning technology and scanning technologies came out of, in a many way, in a large part, out of NSF funding. Antarctic and Arctic research. I already mentioned that NSF is respond is the um, base, if you like, the landlord of the U.S. presence in in Antarctica, um, and um, so our presence and supporting science, everything from the penguins and the various species that are present in Ar the Arctic and Antarctica uh, to neutrino detection, these very tiny subatomic particles at, at the station at the south, at, in a lab at the South Pole, um, to discovery of prehistoric forests in the ice in Antarctica. Um, all of those kinds of things and ever so many more um, have come from that U.S. presence there. Studies of extreme weather, things that we care about quite a bit these days, uh, especially maybe after, the, after this last, last week or so. Um, okay, moving on now over to the right. Virtual reality, one of these um, things that is you know, still figuring out exactly what all the impact of that is going to be, but uh, I think it's clear it's going to be quite profound. Um, much of that development um, has come from NSF funding. Quantum computing, another forward-looking thing that is on the horizon, one of those technologies that um, our government has said we absolutely must be lead in. We cannot afford to be second. Um, NSF has major investment there. 3D printing, I, brought, I put that example there because I believe there is a 3D printer upstairs. And so, uh, you know, that's, um, been developed to a huge extent and you know really fairly quickly. Um, the decline of bee colonies. You know there's a lot of life science there. I'm a physical scientist, so I tend to gravitate towards the physical sciences. But there, but there's a lot of life science in in the NSF funded stuff as well. Biometric ID. You're hearing about that everywhere. And whether, for example, going through security in the airport, you'll be able to get to the point where you don't actually have to touch anything and it's just your iris or something that they can tell it's you. Robotics, um, you know, lots of government agencies, but, um, but there is significant investment in um, NSF there. Uh, CRISPR technology, another life science thing, and if you want to know more about that, you can ask my husband John over here because he's, he's more of the biotype. But anyway, um, and then finally, the image of the black hole, which was published just a few years ago. Um, I just, it's just a gorgeous picture with the donut. And that was a matter of bringing together uh, collaboration from observatories all over the world, different kinds of observatories, Different, from different countries and so forth, bringing it all together so that they could um, really uh, show definitively that this was um, the image of a black hole. Okay, now I'm going to move on and show a few examples from Oregon. So it's just one in each, one in each of a few different areas. Um, I said NSF supports individual researchers. This particular one is from Oregon State University. And the idea is that when you have fluorescent, if, if you um, have um, you, this is biomagnetic fluorescent probes, basically the idea is that you have a 
um, biological uh, species or derive from a biological species that fluoresces. So you shine a light on it and, it and it and it gives off light of a different color that you can detect. So you can see where it is, you can see where it goes. And you can imagine that for detecting particular things, that could be very useful because you might be able to um, get, that, um, get that species so it attaches to a particular kind of thing. So if it uh, attached, you know, if you were looking for whether a surface was clean or dirty, and you had one of these things that attached to the, the thing you didn't want on the surface, and you shine an ultraviolet light on it, and it might fluoresce, um, that could be, you could tell whether or not you had cleaned your surface well. Um, and so, the que but the question is, how, what is it that makes those things function? How do, you, how do they fluoresce? And so, um, this particular project is looking at that. Um, I thought this one was really cool. Um, you know, here we are living right on the coast, and you hear about the, um, the Cascadia Fault, which is shown in this, in this particular um, image. It um, is this orange line here. And um, the, the question is, you know, when will there be an earthquake? Where will there be an earthquake? How big will it be? Well, it's not like we know the answer, but we are trying to figure out what it is that influences all of those things. And um, one of the things that they have identified is that this gray area here has um, sediments that are so tightly compacted that they can't move easily. They're locked up and are jammed, if you like. And so you don't, and, and, there, and, and that is presumably why you don't see much in the line of little earthquakes along there. Whereas down in here, they aren't so tightly compacted, and you do get a fair number of little earthquakes. And if you're watch, you know, if you watch the earthquake activity, we get you know little ones now and then. And um, I I haven't felt any. I have heard one or two from you know very delicate little things in the house that wiggle now and then when something happens. Um, and so the the thinking is, and this is a theory, but the th the thinking is that in these areas where the, soil, the um, earth is not quite so tightly compacted and jammed up, you can actually release that stress as it's building up. Whereas up in this area where it's just jammed up, you're much more likely to get a really big one. So that doesn't help you as to when, but at least there, you're starting to put together some, picture, some pieces of the puzzle. So um, I thought that was really cool. Okay. Major capabilities. So I told you that um, NSF has major facilities. There's the stuff in Antarctica. There are the telescopes. There are ecological observatories that are scattered around this country for looking at different um, things having to do with the atmosphere, with, with um, the um, environment, ecosystem in a particular area. There is a center for atmospheric research that's been going for 50 years in Colorado. Um, but they also do ocean-going stuff, and so there is a set of three research vessels that are under construction. That um, and they are they are regional class, which means you know they're not going to go all the way across the ocean, but they will go well out into the ocean, and they will be able to um, you know do do measurements and, and do research there, and they will be available to to various users who propose projects. Um, and this whole project is being um, managed by Oregon State University. Um, these new things, that are, these new ships that are under construction are acoustically quiet. They've got, you know, the bells and whistles with regard to sensors. And they are equipped to be able to put systems down into the water, surface of the water, down into the water, um, and then to recover them again. So those, those, that's ongoing, and that is being run out of Oregon. In terms of education, um, I thought this was cool. This is in Southern Oregon, inland. Um, you know, Southern Oregon University and a couple of a uh, couple of school districts out there, and they are working on K, K through fifth grade. Um, they want to um, basically get um, elementary school kids thinking about 
um, science in a new way. And in order to reach the students, you got to reach the teachers. So this one is particular aiming for student, for, for the teachers. So they're developing a, a curriculum and um, training teachers. They're piloting it in a couple of school districts in in, um, in the in the Rogue Valley. And the goal is ultimately to deploy it nationwide and um, start getting more computer literacy and more computational thinking in um, students at that very early level. Because one of the problems with um, attracting students into science and mathematics is that if you do, it's, it, these are very hierarchical fields. You've got to start at the beginning. You've got to build it up. You can't take eight courses at once um, because each one builds on the courses that went before it. So you've got to start early. And um, so this is one of the things that's aiming at that. And then finally, this um, is one of the programs that um, NMSEC has for, to provide a research opportunity for undergraduate students. This one actually happens to be based in Charleston, up the, up the road. And the idea is to look at marine biology on the Oregon coast. They bring a bunch of undergraduates in in the summer. They get their feet wet, quite literally. And, um, you know, they, and, they, and they discover things that are you know, worthy of publication in the scientific literature. As undergraduates, that's, that was unheard of when I was when I was in school, at least at least where I went. And so, um, you know, they and they found some species that had not previously been seen in the Charleston area, had previously been seen considerably farther south. So they were known to science; they just weren't known here. Um, and cool stuff like that. Um, and you know, a lot of kids getting an experience like that opens their eyes at something they've never experienced before and it can change their lives. Okay, so I hope I have convinced you that um, the NSF has touched our lives by investing in science and in people. There's the aspect of discovering how the world works from the very smallest, you know, well, well below the scale of the atom, all the way up to the universe. Discoveries that have led to revolutionary technologies whether it's RFID or um, CRISPR or uh, you know, any number of other technologies. Student education and training all the way from elementary school through undergraduate and even on up to graduate and postdoctoral research experience as well. Um, and the early career grants that I uh, told you about that led to ultimately to a couple of Nobel Prizes. And finally, you know, human beings are curious by nature. We just ask why. You know, why is the sky blue? Well, gee, why did that mushroom pop up there as opposed to somewhere else? That kind of thing. And um, and so, you know, the work that NSF supports really helps scratch that itch. And you know, it's one of the things that makes us human. So, thank you. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions from you. But uh, NSF does ha has a board of directors. That is the National Science Board. That is the body on which I sit. Um, the Science Board actually has two duties. One is to serve as a board of directors uh, for NSF. The other is to advise the President and Congress on matters concerning science and engineering in the United States. So it's a dual role. Um, that second one is unbelievably cool and unbelievably important in my opinion. Um, I don't want to belabor it, but the science board has a vision for science, which has NSF as a huge piece of it, but it's bigger than that. And that talks about basic 
basically two things. One is letting the science take you where it will take you. And so that is, um, you know, not overly focusing um, on particular areas. I mean, NSF is the only government agency that has the license and the responsibility of investing across the board. That doesn't mean everybody gets a dollar fifty. It, but it, but it does mean, and and so there are decisions that have to be made about how much goes here and how much goes there. Um, and to some, there's quite a bit of community input that comes into that. Um, and so different communities, for example, the astronomers and astrophysicists are particularly good at developing priorities for what they want. And they say, you know, this is your most important big facility for the next 10 years. Here's your second, here's your third. Um, and NSF usually pays very close attention to it unless it's cost prohibitive. Um, some communities are better at that than others. And the ones that are better at it tend to do better, honestly. Um, so because priorities are important. Um, and the other thing that NSF thinks about is since some agents, some other agencies support, for example, materials, that's one of my fields, um, well, maybe materials doesn't get quite as much support as um, ground-based astronomy, where NSF is essentially the only game. Um, there are some other, um, NSF has come up over years with, with kind of big ideas and stuff like that. And, and I mean, some of that is just how you sell it in Congress, to be honest. But, but there is, they are paying a lot more attention to things that cross traditional disciplinary boundaries. So, you know, say physics to biology, which used to be you know, miles and miles apart and aren't necessarily so much anymore. And, and that kind of thing, they're paying a lot more attention to that, or how you, um, the com computational science and data science influ um, can inform and enhance um, a physical science or a biological science, and then feed back into what you need to do over on the computational science side to advance that. So, so I'd say there's a growing emphasis there. And there is, as I said, there is a strategic plan that talks about all of that thing, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of investments, there's the science, there's the people, which is a huge deal right now because um, when you look at the, PA, at the PhDs in fields that are really important for the up and coming technologies, electrical engineering, computer science, um, economics too for that matter, Half of the PhDs were not born in this country. Uh, we are not producing students that go to graduate school in these fields. I think you get awesome jobs without going to graduate school. Um, that's part of it, and a lot of them don't have the background even to begin to think about it. And, and so people is a big thing that NSF is very concerned about right now. Yes? So are the people on the NSF board, are they chosen through a wide variety of fields? Like you yes. said, your, your field is physical yeah. science. And yeah. so you are chosen because of your involvement with that uh, particular field. Uh, OK, the people on the science board have a very wide variety of backgrounds. Almost all of them have a technical background of one form or another. Um, but it's everything from life science, we have agricultural science, social science. Um, not sure we have any economists right now. I mean, there are 25, so you don't get quite everything. We've had science education people on. I, there's nobody on right now with that. Um, Astronomy, astrophysics is a very popular area right now, so there are at least a couple there. Computer science. Um, and then we have a lawyer who's involved in some startups that, um, and a couple who are involved, who are somehow engaged in startups. Um, so, and uh, there's one, yeah, there is one who is a former congressperson and uh, and well she was president of a 
technical university. So, and and she's a university president now. So, um, but not a technical degree per se. Um, but but very sharp. And you know, it while the science board is blessedly minimally political, it would not be fair to say it's apolitical. Um, it's, but it's one of the most minimally political things in Washington, I, I do have to say that. So, so and, but it, it, the, the way in which science board members are chosen is a, quite the black box. There is a nomination process that the nominations are whittled down by a committee on the board which is then presented to the president's science advisor, and then it goes into a black box, and they've got to figure out you know, what they're going to do with it. And what comes out the other end um, generally is outstanding. Um, then there are sometimes a few questions. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah? So you, you know, at the beginning, politics was very much involved. Because mm -hmm. in 1962, the then president's youngest brother was running for Senate, and Massachusetts got a major NASA facility in Kenton Square that shortly, not long after the assassination, moved into Lyndon Johnson's Texas. Oh, and, you know, I happen to have done it. Of course, that was NASA. NSF has been remarkably free, and one of the things that has been amazing about NSF is that the appropriation, I mean, relative, actually relative to NASA, relative, you know, NIH, as I said, this is, this is small potatoes relative to the federal budget process. <coughs> um, you will get harping among members of Congress about particular, you know, particular projects, Golden Fleece Award, all that kind of thing. But um, NSF, or excuse me, Congress has always avoided um, earmarking within the NSF budget. Yeah, you know, Bush was at MIT at that time. Yeah. And yeah. was very instrumental in that ending up in Cambridge and not in Boston proper. Okay. Yeah. But that wasn't NSF. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other answer. Yeah, no, I mean yeah, no, I mean there there is there is a huge difference in the level of politics in different agencies. And NSF is remarkably free of that. Yeah, I see. Did I uh, misunderstand you when you said that those uh, radio tele uh, tele uh, telescopes, yeah. telescopes down in Chile, do those actually belong to the NSF, or is that a different organization that was funded? Okay, NSF does. Okay, NSF um, run. These are entities that are funded by NSF <laughs> to operate those those telescopes, and so they are. Are they FFRDCs? Are they one of one of these um, en entity federally funded R&D centers or something of that general ilk that receives the NSF funds and operates on behalf of NSF? So the employees are not federal employees, and um, and but they are accountable to NSF. And in fact, for something that big, the Science Board gets very involved in approving. The project at different parts of the way and at regular intervals for either renewal or recompetition of uh, for the operation of those facilities. So of the national labs like Argonne and, and Fermi and most, the entity itself is owned by the government, right? And it's just funded by yes. the labor? Yes. But the national labs are are owned by DO, Department of Energy. And operated by contractors for in University of Chicago in the case of Argonne, mm -hmm. uh, for for on behalf of the federal government. That's Probably. getting kind of arcane. But. A little bit about what your field of study is. What? Yeah. You did do. What? Did, oh, what did what did I what did I do when I worked for a living? <laughs> <laughs> you still have a full yeah. play. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, what I well, when when I was doing research myself, I was actually at Bell Laboratories. So I was at an industrial research laboratory, and I was working on um, materials that you would deposit 
one atomic layer at a time, on top, well, one layer on top of another. And these were materials that were of potential interest for next generation semiconductor devices. That might, you know, I mean, that was, this was kind of pre-cell phone, so, right, because I'm, I'm that old. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but for electronics and computers and, and things like that, and, and so, under, uh, you know, as those devices were shrinking and as they were becoming more and more capable, there was, you know, you had to understand what was going on at the atomic level and you wanted to basically shrink the individual functions down to the point where they were, you know, as they are today, only a few atoms big. And in order to do that, you need a huge amount of control because, I mean, you're, you know, you're basically with a tweezers picking up an atom and putting, or a molecule and putting it where you want it. I mean, figuratively. And, and so, and then once you've made it, you need to figure out what you made and, and what you've made and whether it has interesting properties. And so that's roughly what I did. Sounds like fun. Oh, it was a blast. <laughs> It, it was a blast. You get to play with stuff, make something, and then decide what it what is. Yeah, do. and hang out with some of the smartest, most interesting people on the planet. Huh. Yeah, well, what's not to so like? Yeah. yeah. And actually, you know, even meet your future spouse. Good. Anything's <laughs> possible. <laughs> well, there are some downsides. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never discount divine intervention. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much for coming.